Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this press conference. Late in the afternoon of July 13th at a campaign rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, America witnessed the murder of a father, a husband, a fire chief, Corey Comprator. Two others were severely wounded and, of course, a failed assassination attempt on our former president, Donald J. Trump. You know, back home, this is all that people want to talk about is the Secret Service failure. I think it's time to take a moment before the people behind me prosecute this case. I think it's time to realize why is this so important to people back home? Why is this the topic of conversation? And I'll tell you it's because people back home don't feel safe. The same moms that approached me during the COVID pandemic that didn't want their kids vaccinated, that were scared, they were coming to me saying something's not right. Those same people are coming out of the woodwork again. And it's not surprising. Think about where we are today thanks to the Biden-Harris administration's policies. This is why folks are afraid. We have an open border, cashless bail to fund the police. We ask our police and law enforcement to turn their heads away from riots and vandalism and shoplifting. And now our revered FBI and Secret Service are in disgrace. Folks back home don't trust the FBI anymore and they feel the Secret Service is incompetent. Why is there no trust in the FBI? We have a director who, who blatantly lies and at a hearing says that President Trump was not shot by a bullet. Why is the Secret Service incompetent? Look, I think we can all recognize the individual and systemic failures. There were 10 buildings within 500 yards of the president that all had a direct line of sight for a possible sniper. There was gross disregard of standard operating procedures as the Secret Service failed to use radio communication with those out in the field. The Secret Service has had 48% turnover in a year's time. Barely 50% of them trust their senior leadership. Look, the Secret Service is negligent, incompetent, and there's a cultural failure within their organization. In short, it's a dysfunctional organization. And that's why I'm calling for two things. One is an independent, non-political commission to study and investigate the entire crime scene, leaving no rock unturned. And secondly, and certainly I have no more faith to now than I did before the hearing today, is I'm calling for our Commander-in-Chief to immediately appoint a crisis leadership team to go into the Secret Service, establish that leadership, turn things upside down, and begin providing adequate protection for President Trump and others. There's much more to be said on this. I think I'm going to let my colleagues hit some more of the highlights and maybe I'll come back with a few more comments. I believe Ron Johnson is next. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Those are some pretty good ideas and thank you all for attending this. Um, we are 17 days past an assassination attempt of President Trump. It took the life of an American hero and grievously wounded two others. And there's basic information that we still don't no information that we quite honestly should have known within hours, certainly within days, and yet we're 17 days out. And I, I largely chalk that up to just what has happened inside federal government agencies where the agencies do not believe they're accountable to the American public. They certainly don't believe they're accountable to Congress. I mean, we are learning more from local law enforcement. Quite honestly, what we know about what happened on July 13th primarily comes from local law enforcement. My staff immediately reached out to, to local, state, and federal officials. Uh, federal officials just gave us the big middle finger. Uh, local law enforcement, they'll start talking to us. They, they provide us information. Uh, I published my initial findings in a couple of days, hoping to prompt other agencies to start providing information they had, hope, hopefully also to attract whistleblowers. And we need more whistleblowers. We need people inside the agencies who are willing to talk to us, tell the American people what's really happening. But the initial findings pretty well laid out what the problems were here. First of all, the Secret Service did not attend a 9 o'clock briefing on the morning of the event. Now, in testimony today, Acting Director Rowe didn't answer my question forthrightly. He did talk about something about Secret Service talking to the snipers. But again, I asked him, because his testimony said they did attend that briefing. I don't believe they did. But we didn't get that answer. But that's a big problem. When you have Secret Service in charge of the actual security of the event, 
if they're not attending the briefing in the morning where people are giving their, their final marching orders, their assigned tasks, that's a huge problem. The second thing we found out is all the communication was siloed, and that was a big theme at, at today's hearing. The interoperability of communications, which honestly is a challenge. I don't want to underplay that fact, but the fact of the matter is when you had at 545, we, we just found this out last Friday when committee staff went to Butler and talked to local law enforcement again, we found out at 545 a Secret Service sniper did receive a text with the picture of, of Crooks, of the assassin, and his location. So there was literally 26 minutes before the shot was fired that a Secret Service sniper did know. So even though there wasn't interoperability of, of communication in terms of radios, when, you know, as soon as they saw somebody with a rifle, that the Secret Service was aware of that, 26 minutes beforehand, Secret Service sniper knew there was a person of suspicion. They had a picture of him, and they had 26 minutes to be scanning continuously the AGR building. And, of course, we don't know whether they did or didn't. Why didn't they notice the shooter that did have concealment on that roof? But, again, there's so many unanswered questions, and they shouldn't be unanswered. So, again, I agree. We need an independent investigation. What I'm primarily pushing for, and we do have a bipartisan investigation with the Senator Peters, Blumenthal, Senator Paul, and myself, Homeland Security. Uh, we may have to compel testimony, but the first things we have to do is we have to have transcribed interviews of all the Secret Service personnel at the site, people involved in the planning. Uh, this is just table stakes, and we need those interviews fast. We need them now because memories fade. Memories can be influenced. So, again, that was the big push, and I did appreciate uh, both Senators Blumenthal and Peters made that point at the hearing today. And in fact, Senator Peters closed out the hearing asking uh, Acting Director Rowe, when will he make those 13 individuals that we requested interviews with available? And he said days, not weeks. So we need to hold him to that. So, again, Senator, Senator Marshall, do you have some good ideas here? And thank you all for attending. Thanks, Mark John. Senator Marshall Blackburn is next. Thank you all. It really was quite an interesting hearing. And as you all have seen, there is bipartisan disgust with the conduct at the U.S. Secret Service. I spent my time today covering the issue with FBI Director, Deputy Director Paul Abate, and questioned him on the social media accounts that he had referenced and the other accounts that they are seeking to get information from. Now, he had mentioned one account that said that Crooks was an anti-immigrant individual, anti-Semitic, etc. That was an earlier social media account. We still don't know the platform or the username. And this was when Crooks was probably 14 or 15 years old. The second account is the more current account. It was an account at gab.com. And this account shows Crooks to be someone who is leftist in his leanings. He was pro-illegal immigration. He was pro-lockdowns pro those leftist policies. So what we need to hear from the FBI is clarity around this. We do not need them to come in and provide testimony where they are going to contradict themselves. We need some certainty. I don't know why they would be trying to nuance this. What we had was an assassination attempt on President Trump. And we want to know what happened. The other point that I covered was the issue around whistleblowers and the culture that is at the Secret Service. And this is something that the whistleblower who sent the email this morning pointed out, that the mission at the Secret Service right now is CYA, and that every supervisor is exercising CYA. I think this is completely inappropriate. These are people that have one mission, and it is to make certain that you protect the individual that you're responsible for. There are 31 protectees 
that the Secret Service is responsible for. The urgency of their mission speaks to the fact this isn't like a federal agency that misses their casework numbers or a company that misses their revenue numbers. When the Secret Service screws up, people die. That is what we saw in Butler, Pennsylvania, and they are going to have to be held to account for this. Thank you. Senator Marceline Mullen. Thank you, Roger, for doing this. Uh, you know, <clears throat> this is a world that I used to live in for a little bit, and <clears throat> there's several questions that have to be answered that's not. And they're really simple, right? Who is AIC, the agent in charge? <clears throat> what SOPs are they using, standing operating procedures? Who set the perimeters up? Where were the perimeters? What was the initial plan? Was the initial plan detailed out? Did they walk it? How many meetings did they have with local law enforcement? Who was in charge of those meetings? Did the Secret Service attend the 9 o'clock briefing? If the Secret Service didn't attend the 9 o'clock briefing, the question would be why? <clears throat> because the Secret Service is leading the, the, the entire perimeter and leading the whole detail for the purpose of protecting President Trump. If you can't answer those simple questions, then what are you hiding? Right? Most, most of the time, you start with three perimeters. The first perimeter would be always protected by local law enforcement. It always is. You're using local law enforcement. It's the softer perimeter. It's the perimeter that's protecting all the buildings, making sure there's no high point advantages, uh, that everything is, is clearly being looked at within that first perimeter. They're watching the people coming in. They're paying attention to the individuals, the crowds, which way the crowds are moving, who may be an ag agitator in the crowd. The second perimeter is a little bit harder of a perimeter. It's where you get your bags checked, right? It's where you make sure you have a clear bag. It's where you go through your metal detectors. It's where you present your credentials that you're able to be there. That's going to be local law enforcement. It'll be some uh, uniformed individuals. It'll also be your bigger SWAT team. The inner one, which is called the diamond, they had three jobs to protect the principal from harassment, embarrassment, and death. Harassment, embarrassment, and death. Out of every single detail you run, you always do a debrief. You break it down. What went right? What went wrong? How do we improve? All we're asking is the Secret Service to give us the briefing. What they break down? What's the simple issues that they dealt with? Where was the failure points? Because if you cannot admit you did something wrong, you're destined to do it again. As Senator Blackburn laid out, there's 31 individuals that's, uh, that's uh, every single day. They're, they're depending on the Secret Service to do their jobs. That means there's 31 individuals that have families that's depending on the Secret Service to do their job. They should do their job. We want them to do their job. I spoke with President Trump the day after the assassination attempt. And I'll tell you, the first thing he did is he praised the Secret Service, the ones that were in his diamond, for doing their job. He praised them for jumping in and protecting him. His words was, didn't they do a great job? Yeah, they did do a great job protecting him. They did a horrible job with the perimeter and protecting everybody else that was there. I'm not against the Secret Service, but people need to be held accountable, not just Kimberly, the former director, other people there that was in charge of the site. They need to be held accountable also. And I think that's what Congress is trying to get to. We want to prevent this from ever happening again. We want to help them, but they're not being transparent with us. If they're not, then we'll have to go around them if they're not going to work with us. Thank you, Roger. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Roger. In Butler, Pennsylvania, we saw the worst and most catastrophic security failure of the Secret Service since 1981, the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan. Now, to be clear, the line agents, the Secret Service agents who were protecting President Trump, they demonstrated remarkable bravery that day. They put their bodies between the shooter and President Trump at great risk. So this criticism is not directed at them. But it is directed at the political leadership of the Secret Service. 
Today, we had testimony from the Deputy Director of the FBI and the Acting Director of the Secret Service. And I will say, the Secret Service Acting Director Rowe did marginally better than his predecessor. His predecessor, who has since resigned, approached this shooting with an effort to stonewall and obfuscate and refuse to answer any questions. We had an all-senators briefing that she was on where if you listen to her, nothing went wrong, and they did a fantastic job. She should have resigned the day of this shooting. She did not. She should have been fired the day of this shooting. She was not. Acting Director Rowe at least acknowledged that their failure to secure the roof from where the shooter fired was indefensible. That being said, he continued the pattern we have seen from the Biden administration of stonewalling in this hearing. In the immediate wake of the shooting, the Secret Service official spokesperson sent out a tweet saying, the Trump team never asked for additional security. We did not, we never denied them additional security. In fact, we gave them additional security. We now know that tweet is a lie. The person who sent it, the Secret Service spokesperson, still has his job. The acting director refused to answer whether he personally approved that tweet. He refused to answer whether the then director approved that tweet. We now know because the Washington Post broke the story, not because the Secret Service told it, but because the Washington Post broke the story that repeatedly President Trump's team and President Trump's detail asked for additional agents, additional counter snipers, additional equipment, and repeatedly the Secret Service said no. When I asked the acting director at the hearing how many times did they ask for additional protection, he didn't know the answer to that. When I asked how many times were they denied, he didn't know the answer to that. When I asked who denied it, he said he didn't know the answer to that. He couldn't answer if it was him, couldn't answer if it was the previous director. He started talking about, well, there's a committee, and this committee goes to that committee, and, and it, it was a marvel of bureaucratic nonsense. Apparently, in the Biden Secret Service, the buck stops nowhere. Nobody has responsibility. I asked him, is the individual who denied additional coverage for President Trump the same individual who denied coverage for Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? It's utterly indefensible that RFK went months without Secret Service protection. His father was assassinated running for president. His uncle was assassinated when he was president. RFK Jr. had had multiple death attempts. And yet the Biden administration refused to give him Secret Service protection until after the attempted assassination of President Trump. I believe that decision was political. I believe that decision was partisan and the political leadership of Secret Service understaffed the security detail of President Trump for the same reason they did not provide security to RFK Jr. There are obvious questions that need to be asked. Why were there not more agents assigned? When the shooter at 3 o'clock came through the magnetometer with a rangefinder, why was he not questioned? Why was he not detained? Today, the acting director said, well, it was a civilian rangefinder that you'd use on a golf course. Well, the last I checked, the guy wasn't there to play golf. There is no benign use for a rangefinder at that rally. And yet, they didn't question him when he came in with the rangefinder, and they didn't question him two and a half hours later when they saw him using the rangefinder to measure the distance to where the president was speaking. He provided no answer as to why the roof was not secured. He provided no answer as to why there was no aerial support, there were no drones, there were no helicopters. And he provided no answer as to why the local law enforcement they were relying on could not communicate with Secret Service. We now know that one minute and 57 seconds before the first shot was fired, Bystanders spotted the shooter on the roof with a rifle. We've all seen the videos on X. Pointing out, he has a gun, he's on the roof, pointing it out to local law enforcement. 
That was a minute and 57 seconds before the first shot. If local law enforcement was able to speak to Secret Service, they would have pulled President Trump from the podium and he never would have been shot and nobody else would have been killed. We also know that a local police officer climbed up to that roof to examine directly what was happening and the shooter pointed his rifle at him. The local police officer ducked down, fell to the ground. That was 24 seconds before the first, first shot was fired. Presumably that officer has a radio, but the Secret Service hasn't told us that. Presumably with the radio, the instant he saw a gunman on the roof with a rifle, you would be in the radio saying, shooter, shooter, gun, gun. 24 seconds is a lot of time for a Secret Service detail to go and pull President Trump down. It's a lot of time for a counter sniper to take out that sniper. The only rational inference is that local police was not able to talk to Secret Service. And from their testimony today, they've done nothing to improve it. Now, another set of questions that I asked, what's the relevant size of President Trump's detail compared to Joe Biden's detail compared to the First Lady's detail? Secret Service refused to answer that question. The obvious follow-up is, what is the relative threat level? How many threats are directed at Donald J. Trump? How many threats have been directed at President Biden? How many threats have been directed at the First Lady? Those are simple questions that require accountability. I hope and expect we will get them. But the critical question, and I want to underscore the call that has come from multiple senators for whistleblowers. I believe the rational inference from the evidence we know now is it was political bias at the top, at the leadership of the Secret Service, that led to insufficient agents and insufficient resources being devoted to protecting President Trump. And if it is true, we need to see on writing the discussion of why they didn't act sufficiently to keep the president safe. All right, Mike Lee's next. The late Associate Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., used to say that there's a point of contact in every case, and he defined that point as the place where the boy got his finger caught in the machinery. Comparing that statement here, we might say it's a point of failure. Where are the points of failure that the Secret Service should have acknowledged? Where are the points of failure that after 17 days since this assassination attempt, the Secret Service still hasn't even answered the most basic questions. Look at, let's look at what some of those were. First of all, why on earth did they ever let Donald Trump take the stage? He had already been identified as a suspicious person, a suspicious person who had entered with a rangefinder, something that one doesn't normally bring to a political rally. They otherwise regarded him as suspicious. They had taken photos of him. They had sent those things along to the Secret Service. Why on earth did they not remove President Trump from the stage after spectators and local law enforcement assigned to help protect the president had noticed that there was a guy with a rifle on a roof? By the way, it was a sloped roof, and uh, noticeably absent today was the sloped roof defense. I don't understand exactly well, what role that played in their initial pronouncements. Now, after this attack, uh, maybe they got roofied or otherwise convinced to adopt a feigned slope, sloped roof defense, but that was absurd, as was the Secret Service's initial denials of the repeated requests made to the Secret Service for additional protection. Also unanswered, but that falls squarely within the context of the uh, point of contact or the point of failure, why on earth did the snipers assigned to the second story window with a clear view of that infamous sloped roof, a clear view of where the shooter stood and tried to kill President Trump. Why was that manned initially with snipers, with sharpshooters, and then abandoned at some point before the shooting took place? Now look, these are and should be obvious and easy basic questions for the Secret Service to answer. And they have had no fewer than 17 days since the attack to answer these questions. These are questions that they should have started asking and probably should have uh, been able to answer 
within 24 hours. And yet again and again and again, what I heard, what my colleagues heard, what you heard if you were watching, was worth looking into it. I'm sorry, that doesn't cut it. These are legitimate questions. And for the reasons that we've identified, it's not as though the Secret Service has comported itself in a manner that calls out to us to defer to them, to have confidence in them. Nobody wants to believe the worst, to suspect the worst of, about what happens within government. But when they lie to us repeatedly, then when they refuse to answer the most basic questions, when they almost willfully decline to take any of the most basic precautions in order to protect the president, the former president, and I hope the next president of the United States, one has to wonder. Remember, King David didn't personally kill Uriah the Hittite, but he let him go out into a battlefield where he knew there was an imminent risk of grave bodily injury, and he made sure he didn't have adequate protection. We've got to get to the bottom of these questions to make sure that Donald Trump was not intended to be a Uriah the Hittite. Well done, Bathsheba. So we, yeah, we, have to, <laughs> we have to get King David his own representation. Uh, like John Cornyn, go ahead. Well, it's obvious there were multiple points of failure on this day where it, uh, that resulted in the loss of one life and three injured individuals, including the former President of the United States and Republican nominee for President in 2024. Some of the things that struck me were, for example, the drone that was used by the shooter to surveil the grounds to see where everybody was and where they were not. And um, amazingly, when the Secret Service tried to use their drone, they said there was a network congestion. Uh, I asked the obvious question, why if the shooter's drone worked, why didn't the Secret Service's drone work? And they said, well, we're, we're looking into that. Secondly, the, as you know, the uh, drones are ubiquitous these days, and they can also be weaponized. So there may, would not have been even the necessity uh, for the shooter to have a gun if he had an ability to deploy a weaponized drone that day, something that the, that the Secret Service was completely unprepared to deal with. I asked, do you have electronic warfare or jamming capability. And they said, well, we really can't talk about that here. Another one of their multiple points of failure. And then, as you've heard from my colleagues up here, the, the fact that a suspicious individual was identified, uh, the acting director wanted to say, well, it wasn't until we saw the gun that we know, knew he would be a problem or a, a threat. But the fact of the matter is, the Secret Service allowed President Trump to go on the stage without having adequately investigated this suspicious individual. If they had simply asked him to stand down while they investigated, they would have discovered the shooter, and this shooting uh, would never have occurred in the first place. Next, the Secret Service simply tried to delegate to local law enforcement their responsibilities, which are to keep their protectees safe. And the uh, acting director made the point of saying Secret Service are the elite in law enforcement. And I believe that's true. These are the best of the best. But then for some reason, when it came to pr providing protection to, for President Trump, they delegated this to local law enforcement, obviously people less trained to deal with the sorts of threats that uh, they saw that day, resulting in another point of failure. But finally, the lack of communication or ability to communicate the threat to the agents on the stage with the president was another point of failure. Because if they had been able to have simply a walkie-talkie or radio which would have communicated from the field directly to the agents, they could have asked the president to keep his seat and to stay out of harm's way. So thanks to, uh, thanks to the uh, divine intervention, President Trump did not lose his life that day. I told him that it's obvious God has other plans for him. But the fact of the matter is the so, that, uh, that the Secret Service has now been transferred since 2003 to the Department of Homeland Security. 
Now, why should that cause any of us concern? Well, you've seen the job that the Department of Homeland Security is doing at the southern border with about 10 million people released in the interior of the United States. Alejandro Mayorkas should have resigned years ago, completely incompetent, lied to Congress repeatedly, and now he's in charge of the Secret Service because they're part of the Department of Homeland Security. Obviously, we need to look at this matter from top to bottom, and we need to fix the uh, Secret Service so no future candidates or existing office holders are exposed to this sort of threat again. Thanks, John. I just want to put an explanation point on this, and we'll open it up to questions. I think my colleagues did an excellent job of pointing out both the individual and systemic failures by the Secret Service on the day of this assassination uh, attempt. And that's why we need a crisis intervention team to go in right now. We don't have to wait to see what the findings are from, this, from all the studies that we're doing right now. That being said, we need to make sure we uncover every stone, and that's why we need some type of an independent non-political commission to dive deep into this. So we'll stop there. Some questions. Josh in the back, go ahead. Was there ever any discussion in the planning stage about communicating from the advance team the Trump security detail or the campaign risk of the clear line of sight from the ATR radar? We, based on your discussions with secret We service. haven't got any of that. They, they haven't told us that. Is it the I mean, the simple question is, is why wasn't it inside the perimeter to begin with? That would be the simple question, right? That hasn't even been answered. Uh, we haven't been told how many how many rings of perimeters did they have. Did they have one, two, or three? I mean, obviously they had two, but did they have the third one to push out? This is only 150 yards, 140 yards from, from the platform. It, it, when you're setting up a perimeter, you take all points of advantage. You take the water tower and you take every building around there that has direct sight. That is your third perimeter. That's your outer perimeter. So there's no, there was obviously no communication about it, but it would be the Secret Service that would be in charge of setting out the site planning to begin with. So I would assume not, but they haven't told us. You know, I think the frustrating to me is that there, that there was no standard of operating uh, procedures defined or followed. Where should this first perimeter be? How far should it go out? Should there be any buildings left within 500 yards of the president with the direct line? Well, obviously there should not be. Um, w when do we decide to give President Trump more protection? There seemed to be no guidance. It seemed to be too political of an opportunity here. John? Uh, well, sir, I was going to ask. Uh, I know I think it came up during the hearing that uh, someone said they thought there were about 1,500 people short in terms of manpower and the different team role that, that, that the budget is being for that or the coverage that they're going to have those manpower resources. I think we've doubled their budget in the last 10 years. They have 8,000 agents protecting 33 people. Uh, that they need to be able to roll up the people that are sitting and doing nothing in those offices. And I say nothing. I don't. Mean, I shouldn't be that cavalier. They are doing important things. But obviously, uh, in this situation, President Trump probably needed four or five times that. I would argue that it would be next to impossible to make that particular site uh, safe for the president. Um, it's it's going to take more than just throwing money at it. And I think certainly it starts with leadership. And that's what we're lacking right now is, is leadership. The, the AIC would be the one that would, the agent in charge, would be the one that would ask that, right? Did you want to shut the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I just want to get it. I'm sorry. The, the AIC would be the agent in charge of the site. That would be the agent in charge of the whole, uh, the, the whole venue that was setting up the, the uh, protective uh, perimeters would be the one that would set how many personnel he needs to guard it specifically. And so that would be one question that would need to be asked. Was a request given and was it denied? That would be a simple communication because that should be. Those site plans for, for, for uh, the setting up the perimeters, that should have been given out. Uh, to. I mean, that should be documentation. There's no question about it. I mean, when we used to do site planning, we would actually draw it out, and that would be part of the briefing. You would put it up on the wall or you'd put it out on emails, you know, tell you how long until I, would do, I was doing it. But you'd put it up on the wall, and you would actually assign, here's building A, B, C, D, or building 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight, whatever it is, and how many people it's going to take to secure that building and, and block off all, all, those, all that whole perimeter. And that would be your personnel that you set by those perimeters. So without that, we don't know. We don't know actually how many people were actually needed to, to protect that site to make it secure. Well, but given, given what happened... I think it's indisputable that there were not sufficient agents assigned to protect Donald Trump. 
that for that location, that roof was not secured, there were not agents in place to be aware of the, of the sniper, there were not agents in place, there were not counter snipers who had visibility on, 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 the, on the shooter, there was no aerial assets. We know from public reporting there have been multiple requests from the Trump team for additional uh, agents, for additional equipment, and that those requests have been turned down. At the hearing, I asked, what is the relative size of the Secret Service detail that was assigned to Donald Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania, compared to the Secret Service detail that is assigned to Joe Biden, compared to the Secret Service detail that is assigned to the First Lady? There were reports that on the day of the, uh, of the, of the rally, the Secret Service transferred agents from Donald Trump's detail to protect the First Lady. Now, look, it is important to protect the First Lady. But the acting director refused to answer any question about the relative size of how many agents are assigned. And what I believe happened is the Secret Service was treating Donald Trump as a former president. Former presidents are given Secret Service details, but not that extensive a Secret Service details. Typically, the threat profile a former president is facing is significantly less than Donald Trump is facing. Donald Trump is not just a former president. He is the Republican nominee to be president. And he is one of two people who is likely to be the next president of the United States. And it's why the request of the threat levels, how many threats, how many credible threats there are, is so important because this decision is supposed to follow the threats. And, and, and I believe what, what the Department of Homeland Security did, what Alejandro Mayorkas did, is they didn't want to assign that additional protection because they didn't want to confer, I guess, legitimacy to Trump. I think it is the very same reasoning that led them to deny a Secret Service de detail to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. because the fact that RFK Jr. is running is politically inconvenient to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and giving Secret Service detail would legitimize it. If that's their reasoning, Congress and the American people deserve to see in writing why they said no because if you're actually doing your job, the job of the Secret Service, there clearly should have been additional agents. There should have been an agent on that room roof. The shooter should have been detained and questioned, and there should have been aerial assets. None of those happened. And today, Secret Service answered none of those questions as to why they didn't happen. Go ahead. Hey, Marcus, thank you. Uh, Farnan from AP. Um, you mentioned you guys would like an independent, non-political commission. Can you talk about, first of all, what that would look like? Is that different? than what's happening in the House side. They have a bipartisan commission that they've, um, you know, they've put up. Is this, is there an effort to streamline what the House and Senate are doing so that you guys don't overlap, that you don't, you know, get it interfering with each other's sources? Obviously, you know, Senator Johnson and, and Grassley have their own whistleblower program and, and sources that they have. Is there an effort to streamline this because there is bipartisan support? I, I don't see an effort to streamline it on both sides. It appears to me, as usual, each a house up here is going to do their own thing. To me, the big difference is it's apolitical. Neither re Republicans nor Democrats, people that really I don't know what party they belong to, experts in the field that are going to go out and do the hard work. And then they can feed the results to those particular committees. But I think it's more of a 9-11 style commission where it's, there are apolitical, non-political people out there that are true experts in the field that have the time to do this. We don't have the time nor the staff to get to the answers we quickly need to. I think that this is something that the president could, uh, t could appoint. I think it's something that if the House and Senate leadership got together, they could do as well. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Senator, the uh, deputy FBI director said that they didn't have any solid evidence on the motive for the shooter, but then they go ahead and mention a uh, social media account that might be uh, the shooter and that had apparently posted anti-immigration and anti-Semitic uh, uh, posts. Uh, do you think that was appropriate by the deputy FBI director, or do you think that's part of Senator Feinstein's political bias in the in the leadership? Uh, look, it's difficult to tell because there was very little transparency from the FBI either. Uh, the CEO of Gab has said that there was a social media page of the shooters that indicated that he was a left-wing activist. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but the FBI certainly didn't acknowledge it. And, and I will say, look, I think one of the most concerning aspects of the Biden-Harris administration over the last four years has been the politicization of law, of law enforcement, the politicization of the Department of Justice, of the FBI, of the entire machinery of government. And, and, and so 
it raises natural questions. That is the FBI uh, partially revealing information to frame a political narrative? Because they're not transparent, because they're not telling us what they found, because they are stonewalling and the Secret Service is really stonewalling, uh, it is difficult to know what the facts are. I think the American people have a right to know the facts. Yeah. Let's go to the very back. Go ahead. Um, Can you answer? I, I, I uh, have a very simple term to this. The proof's in the pudding, right? If he comes transparent and he's open uh, and honest with Congress, I think that speaks volume. I'm not, I'm not concerned about him capable, uh, his capabilities because he has, uh, he has you know, a, quite a historic record of being very capable of doing his job. It's just how he handles it moving forward. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt uh, and, until he proves us wrong. I, I think it's I think it's next to impossible to take any person from within the Secret Service to turn it around right now. I've been through enough things personally in my life, whether it was a coaching problem or a superintendent problem or a pastor that needed to go, and there was a big major cultural issue within that organization that it takes somebody from outside to come in and actually objectively evaluate the situation, that there are such significant cultural breakdowns within the Secret Service right now, it literally is going to take a crisis management team. I think he's fine in his role right now as acting director, but I don't think that he has the skill set or the objective ability to turn this Secret Service around and take it to the place where America has confidence in it once again. I think that his unwillingness, as I hear him say, I take responsibility, but... But I'm not going to tell you if we actually had our meeting that morning or not with him. And he didn't know if they really had a meeting with the local police or not. His unwillingness to say who makes the decision when it comes to who gets Secret Service and how much. It, it was Again, he, he was too focused on covering the actions of the Secret Service. So I don't think that he has the ability to turn this around. Somebody needs to stay in place from within. But we really need an entire new management team in there and shake this place up. I do. I, I believe the Secret Service uh, director should be Senate confirmed. I'm supporting legislation to do precisely that. But, but let me say on, on your question a moment ago, I'm going to agree with Mark Wayne, that, that, that the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, I thought the acting director's testimony today was markedly better than the testimony of the previous director. The previous director demonstrated, to my mind, an almost complete contempt for the notion of accountability and would not answer any questions and in fact maintained effectively that the Secret Service had done nothing wrong. And, and the proof of it was that President Trump was still alive when it is, had, the, had that bullet been a half inch to the left, history would have been different and President Trump would have been murdered that day. That is a total security failure on the part of the leadership of Secret Service. So. The acting director, I was glad in his opening remarks, he stood up and took responsibility and admitted at the outset it was indefensible that that roof was not secured, that that, that, that was a good place to start. But then his testimony was disappointing that repeatedly he refused to answer straightforward questions, questions he should have known the answer to. And for me, it's going to come down to two things. Number one, how he responds to the questions for the record. I will be submitting a number of questions for the record. Other members of the committee will. Detailed questions in writing. And what I expect from the acting director is complete candor and transparency. If he behaves as he did this afternoon, circling the wagons and wanting to protect everyone at Secret Service to say we did nothing wrong, I think that will demonstrate he is not qualified for that job and does not understand the magnitude of the stake. So I think question number one, does he demonstrate candor and transparency? And number two, is he able to change how Secret Service operates? Look, the most compelling question is what are they doing differently today? The shooter in Butler, Pennsylvania was not the last threat to any of the protectees under Secret Service protection. What is Secret Service doing today to do differently? Are they su assigning sufficient agents? Are they using assets? Are they using air assets? Are they using drones? Are they using helicopters? Are they going and questioning suspicious individuals? 
Have they worked through the communication if they're relying on local law enforcement and yet they can't communicate with them? That needs to be fixed immediately because the most compelling priority is to make sure, God forbid, another assassin does not carry out another attempted assassination or successful assassinations. That's the Secret Service's job, and that'll be the test of whether he's qualified to do the job. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.